Thank you, Dawit and Candice, for hosting. I really appreciate being able to share some news about the Cali DNA program with all of you and um, to potentially start some collaborations from this. So um, I'm going to just jump in. Feel free to ask questions at any time. So we know that we are losing a lot of biodiversity in this century, and we need to do something about it. Um, the University of California is involved in many different programs um, across the state and uh, national and international um, for biodiversity monitoring and potentially management and also the basic science to understand the fundamental questions of how does biodiversity, uh, how is it maintained, what shapes it. Um, the University of California recently launched a conservation genomics consortium that's a little bit more applied trying to develop genomics tools to actually be easily translatable and adoptable to solve some of the more management-oriented uh, questions. And then also, uh, the Earth Biogenome Project launched with one of the founders, Harris Lewin, at UC Davis, which is a, an initiative to sequence high-quality genomes for every family of eukaryotes on the planet. So, we realized that with all of these great sequencing initiatives, and many of them happening in California, that there is going to be a lot of data for the, spe the rich species that we have here, where we could actually use the DNA data to perhaps scale up our environmental observations. So um, we know that uh, satellite data, airborne LIDAR data have been tremendously powerful to be able to predict environmental change and also to find hot spots of biodiversity that could be conserved that maybe hadn't been identified before. Environmental DNA might present an additional layer. Right now, we don't have a way to real-time monitor biodiversity at any sort of scale like abiotic data. But what if we could involve the public and actually really have big data where you could understand migration patterns or um, what's in your neighborhood, sort of like you check the weather every day? iNaturalist and other citizen science platforms have been incredibly uh, helpful to leverage the energy that the public has to help their environment become more resilient, to turn that into data. So there are over a million people that use iNaturalist. Many of them are in California because it launched in California. It's managed by the California Academy of Sciences. And it's very simple. Everyone has a smartphone, so you can take a photograph of an organism, uh, connect it, uh, share it online with other fellow naturalists who could be informal, uh, like hobbyists, all the way to you know, the taxonomic expert for that millipede that you photographed, uh, waiting for someone to put a photograph of an insect online um, uh, or some other bug. And then uh, you have a platform to discuss your findings. So this not only engages people in data collection, but also in the analysis. And so now we have this community of people that are really primed to be able to do more, to be able to build a strong feedback loop with professional scientists and manage, monitor the biodiversity in their local areas really well. We also have the California Naturalist Certification Program that's got, I think, 40, over 40 different uh, campuses in the different biomes of California where you can get local naturalist skills. So we have this incredible workforce here. What we want to do is help people understand what's here, what defines the habitat that they're in, and to be able to track if that habitat is changing. And we're really excited that we don't need to go monitor the mammals and the insects and the, uh, uh, the, the spiders and everything separately. We can just look at dirt. Because in soil or in sediment or in water is loose environmental DNA from all of the organisms that were physically in that dirt sample, like maybe some of the bacteria and archaea and fungi, um, 
as well as organisms that shed DNA that may have passed through. Environmental DNA um, has been really a diverse technique. It's been applied to social justice issues, to understanding geochemistry and you know, ecosystem uh, cycles. It's been very important for understanding the microbiome for human health and animal health. Uh, it's really uh, got a lot of potential to connect different disciplines of science. And we're really excited because to collect it, you're just filling, putting gloves on, filling a tube of soil, or filling a bottle of water. And um, so it can be really easily crowdsourced, and it can be uh, used to go back in time. So I actually have a project that's not related to CaliDNA, but uh, going through sediment from lakes in Southern California from the Pleistocene to the current day. So we can go back like 34,000 years with environmental DNA if it's in conditions where it's preserved. But on the surface, we have a nice record of, say, the last six months to a year of what's been in that location. So it can be a very local signal, which can tell you a lot about the local community uh, in recent time. So the Cali DNA program is based on that anybody can volunteer as a community scientist. We use the term community scientist because citizen scientists isn't really in vogue anymore because it, nobody wants to accidentally imply citizenship to volunteering. Um, people can come to us and say, I want to get trained. I want to learn how to collect soil samples and so, or sediment samples. And so there's lots of training that we offer online. And we also do training at BioBlitzes, which are group events where everyone goes and hikes around and takes a naturalist photographs and also collect samples. And they're a lot of fun. We also have a big undergraduate internship program where we teach people how to do all of the laboratory work and analysis of eDNA. And we're working with other organizations like SWERP um, and uh, uh, people at the Natural History Museum at the at Cal State campuses to also try to kind of unify our approach to the environmental DNA informatics pipeline so that we can make data more interoperable. We're doing DNA metabarcoding, but like I said, um, like I mentioned with the Earth Biogenome Project, if there are eventually whole genomes of California native species that we want to monitor, we can leverage those entire genome resources with the DNA that we've extracted and not only look at species, but look at functional genes and look at demography demography. Um, so we might be able to even get population level uh, information from the DNA. So right now we're just doing metabarcoding, but the, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to move environmental DNA into really cool uncharted territory, um, starting in California, because we have these um, initiatives launching here, and so many scientists to focus on the biodiversity that we have. So again, what I'm calling the parabiome is right now a metabarcoding approach that uses five different markers. 16S, which is frequently used for bacteria and archaea. 18S, targeting broad eukaryotes. It's great because it targets broad groups, but it doesn't have very high species level resolution. ITS1, which is targeting mainly fungus. And then uh, the CO1 mitochondrial region, which targets uh, animals, but also gets oomycetes very well, um, which includes things like Phytophthora. And then uh, the second ITS2, which targets angiosperms, but also we get gymnosperms really well. We don't get ferns very well with that. And the MyFish 12S primers for fish. We have some additional primers that we occasionally use if we're working, say, in the desert where we have higher rates of degradation, like TRNL. So we, can, we have the options to also look for uh, organisms using shorter DNA fragments that uh, you can pick up in a more degraded sample that may have been exposed to harsher elements. A lot of the team from the UC Conservation Genomics Consortium has um, really helped advance the precision of our lab work. So for example, the different polymerases that you could use when you're doing PCR, they can introduce a lot of bias depending on the GC content of your, uh, of your DNA templates in your sample. 
And so this is a big problem if you're especially looking at relative abundance. So on the right, you'll see some numbers on the yellow, on the, on the, in the yellow. Those are the numbers of papers that use the polymerases in the graph. And you'll see that 381 is for the fusion polymerase. That has a very low R squared value, meaning it has a lot of GC bias. Your observed and expected proportions are not good. We use the Kyogen hot star uh, polymerase, which almost has zero GC bias, but it's not very frequently used yet. So we're trying to make recommendations based on these findings um, so that people can all kind of come together to use some of the best products, and we can also um, help relay that to the companies that make them. Um, here's an example of the... Oh, I'm getting feedback. Okay, sorry. Of uh, what can happen if you have GC bias. So each line, uh, this is, these are qPCR graphs, each line is a, a different plant DNA template and how much it amplifies with every cycle of PCR. And so what you start with at 20 cycles ends up looking very different in terms of relative abundance to 40 cycles because of GC bias. So we try to reduce that. Um, and that work was mainly done at UC Santa Cruz with Beth Shapiro. Um, then we also are trying to build tools to help the public um, from natural reserve managers to students to everyone um, to really engage with the data and not just look for their favorite species, but try to understand <coughs> that it's all about the patterns that we see. And um, we really need to, to, to look very broadly as a, at sort of a system level. So we have this website, ucedna.com. Please go to it. We're still improving it all the time. We have a great programmer that works with us. Um, you can explore the samples that have already been collected and um, see the biodiversity in every single sample. So if you're a volunteer, you can track your sample. And eventually, when we process it, you can see not only the photograph that you took, but all of the um, all of the taxa that we matched to the DNA sequences. We get, on average, about 1,000 unique taxa per DNA sample. What we're also building are tools to relate environmental DNA to other types of observations. For example, the Bi Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF, houses the iNaturalist and eBird observation data. So how do we fit in with all of the other community science data that's being collected. So on the top, those are, this is a case study I'll be presenting to you in a few moments. Um, this is Pillar Point at Half Moon Bay near San Mateo. And we have 88 eDNA samples that were collected by volunteers. This was our first BioBlitz in collaboration with Cal Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles to sort of look at how um, iNaturalist observations and eDNA observations relate to each other. So on the bottom are the iNaturalist observations, and you can see that they are much richer than the eDNA observations. And on the left, this left polygon, um, the red highlighted polygon that's drawn, that's a marine protected area. And so humans are not supposed to just from the public are not supposed to just wander in there, although people do a little bit, but it has far fewer observations, uh, photographic observations made with iNaturalists than, say, this blue polygon, oops, this blue polygon where there's unprotected tide pools that school groups can go to, uh, everyone can sort of go out on lo low tide and really look at what's um, in the tide pools and, uh, and explore. So it's very heavily frequented. Uh, every month, iNaturalist uh, bioblitzes occur there. And then on the right is this embayment where you have a marsh where there's a lot of uh, ag runoff. And you also have um, a lot of boats that are docked. So you have a, actually quite high bird observation diversity here. So how do these um, photographic observations relate to eDNA observations? Um, another thing that we're doing and we're trying to build out is when we see environmental DNA patterns, for example, we have a transect that was coastal, shrub scrub, 
and forest, lowland forest in California. Um, we found, for example, from a random forest analysis that the amount of silt or elevation are uh, different factors that are highly predictive of the environmental DNA signatures that we find. And we can explain how much each family across all of the tree of life is predictable by these abiotic factors. Um, so how do we get the public excited about those results? Well, one of the things that, we're, that we have on our website, um, and this will become more powerful as we scale up and eventually we can make uh, models from this, say, species uh, site occupancy models or species distribution models, um, is you have different map functions. So my recent favorite thing is diatoms, so we'll look at those. <laughs> so Bacillariaceae, these you can, you, can, you can look on our Explore data page, type in uh, the name of a taxon that you're interested in at any level of classification, and you can see out of the samples that we've sequenced so far where it's been found. And then, okay, so maybe not everyone cares a lot about diatoms. The group I'm talking to right now probably cares very much about diatoms. I recognize that. But we'll, we'll, move, to, we'll move to tardigrades as an example. So here we found tardigrades in 58 samples. And this is something like every student wants to know, how do you predict where tardigrades live in California? Because everyone wants to find them, even though if you found them, you wouldn't be able to really see them with your naked eye. So um, we still don't know, but this is something that as we accumulate data, right now we have 58 samples out of the 500 something that have been sequenced and put online where tardigrades have been found. And so eventually we'll be able to find the environmental predictors for tardigrades. And, um, and those are projects that we want to hand over to students or to the public to do, and then to have a feedback loop with us so that we can also guide more bioblitzes in that direction and, um, and really figure this out. So we have different maps that you can go through to start to generate your own hypotheses. Oh, is there something about human impact that relates to tardigrades? Or um, are they sort of less frequently on the coast and more inland? So um, just to refresh, Kelly DNA, you do some training. We send you a kit that has gloves, tubes, um, a straw, uh, and then you use your app to uh, collect the uh, metadata while you're collecting your sample. Um, everything's pre-barcoded, and so then you just mail it back. We give you some meters where you can collect pH, temperature, other data, and then you just take photographs. So it's a, it's a pretty easy, like low bar um, to complete a kit successfully, and then we pay for all of the shipping. Uh, we've had lots of volunteers, um, about a thousand volunteers now. We also have a software that is being used by about a dozen graduate students and um, people at different institutions called Anacapa, named for Mirage Island, which is what Anacapa means in Chumash. And that's because maybe eDNA gives you a signal that you don't know how accurate it is. So, so we had some jest with that. And then we also have some online um, community ecology statistical analysis tools like Ranacapa, so that's R, Anacapa. Um, that's a shiny app, so we can actually give people the data sets and let them do alpha and beta diversity analysis. And even if they have no background in community ecology, it's pretty intuitive to interpret bar plots and coordination plots. And we found that managers, especially UC reserve managers, where we've done a lot of these uh, bio blitzes, they really want to, 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 in, to engage with the data to see how their reserve compares to other nearby UC reserves. We've also started a collaboration with NASA JPL climate scientists and engineers to use their hyperspectral data that they've been collecting for different parts of California and see how that helps improve um, biodiversity predictions with eDNA. Um, on the bottom right, you'll see an image of a burn zone. So we actually have a Woolsey fire project right now that we're hopefully hopefully going to get some extra funding for to be able to track biodiversity as it comes back and to understand the role of refugia in seeding uh, the biodiversity in the burned uh, surrounding areas. 
So um, this study on Pillar Point, there's a link here. Uh, it's not something that we've shared widely with the public. We're still building out tools. But this is like our big beta testing site where we're trying to see how uh, photographic observations by the community scientists and eDNA observations by community scientists can really complement each other. And so um, we are using GBIF that I introduced earlier. And we've also used some uh, very special DNA barcode sequences from coastal invertebrates that the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles has collected. So these were um, DNA barcodes from California, and we wanted to see how much they also enriched the, uh, the results that we got. So I can't go into too much detail, but what we do see is the diversity profiles um, of the different sections of Pillar Point, that protected area, that unprotected area, and the in embankment are really very different looking from each other through the lens of eDNA and GBIF as you go through taxonomic ranks. And that's because GBIF is mainly observations of animals. As a botanist, I always say people are plant blind. And this is totally the case for photographic observations, is we don't have very many people reporting, um, inventorying fungi, plants, algae, and other photographable things. Um, but for eDNA, and of course, we're, we're, for eDNA, maybe we're not as good at recording, inventorying, say, the birds, but we have a good record of the bird mites. So we're getting smaller organisms. We actually get more of the lower trophic levels. So in a way, we, we really can complement our results with the uh, photographic observations of bigger, more, more mobile things that aren't, more, that aren't really ubiquitous in the environment. Um, and so here's a graph just presenting some summary statistics of how we align. So eDNA, we tracked 82 phyla. Um, GBIF tracked 19 phyla. Of the GBIF records, all 19 phyla were in eDNA results as well. We had high concordance at the level of class the level of order. And then once you get to the level of family, you start to see a split. And one of these questions was, is that because we're truly detecting different things? Or is it because maybe because we're limited with the sequences that are available because there's some bias? Well, it turns out that the bias is very much the same. Also, we have to recognize that photographic observations are often being matched to species by machine learning algorithms or deep learning algorithms that use databases that are also very limited um, in predicting what that species is. So we're all just working with like the best shot that we can, but we have limitations. Genetic, uh, genetic uh, references that are limited, or maybe morphological characters that we're limited in uh, looking at from a photograph. So here um, on this plot, you can see that we don't really have these singleton Singleton observation tails in phylum, class, or order, but we do as we get to genus and species in both GBIF and eDNA. I think it's 1230 now, correct? Yeah. But you oh, have I have two minutes. Five more minutes, yeah. With the question. Okay. okay, great. So this is my, my last slide. Um, one thing that we've shown uh, is that we can find in places where we don't have very many photographic observations, like the protected area of Pillar Point, we can find that it's highly similar, with, based on eDNA, um, to the tide pools. So what's nice is we can say, OK, if we can do observations here in the tide pools, we can actually predict that they look very similar to the protected area. And then we can also pull apart the species that are in the protected area that are not in the tide pools and, and highlight what's, um, what's there. Uh, with network analyses, it's been really incredible to find these functional associations that help us understand that actually the tide pools, uh, sorry, the protected area are functioning very differently. And in the polluted embankment of Pillar Point, we get haphazard biodiversity, where you see many more um, different colors in this bar plot, uh, where uh, sort of you don't have a regulated uh, system anymore. So we have beta diversity um, analyses as well, where we can show that abiotic factors really are good predictors for a lot of different family level and class level um, designations. 
And I'm going to leave it at that. Um, thank you so much, and I'm, I'll take questions. Yeah, we have some time for questions. If you have questions, you can jump in. Or you can type it in the text box. Is there, is there any questions there? No. So right now we're, we're just exploring lots of different analyses. We're trying to publish some papers. We're trying to scale up. We have undergraduate education modules that we've built. If there are bio blitzes that you're interested in running or participating in, we'd really love to connect, and um, especially to connect other communities in California that are doing environmental DNA. Uh, that's good to know. Any, if there is no, I have one question. You have one question. Yeah, Great. Thank you. Uh, so, if you see different biodiversity um, among organisms in protected environments and adjacent unprotected in environments, are you able yet to draw a correlation between what the protected, the, the characteristics of the protected environment that are allowing the the more stable yes. uh, display. Yes, I, I think we are getting there. Um, for example, the network analysis showed that the higher amount of kelp in the protected environment was sustaining a specific community of ammonium oxidizing microbes. And so those were, in turn, sustaining other organisms. Okay, that's, so we, we are starting to see that. So I, I and, um, papers on that. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, we've seen more um, in the protected area. We've seen more anemones, more um, a, other echinoderms, and I'm 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 going to gosh I can't ever remember the Latin name for the life of me <laughs> of this one um, group. Is there there's like basal chordates that look like little polyps? But they're actually like vertebrates. Um, they're beautiful. I, tunicates? I'm just basing on the name. Pardon? Tunicates? Yes, line? tunicates is in the group, but it's a yes. Okay. So we see more of those in the marine protected area as well. Yeah. There is one more question. Sure. Okay, this is uh, from the chat. Um, what would be the temporal resolutions of eDNA for different taxa? Could months or seasons or time of day matter? Well, that's a great question. For eDNA, as soon as DNA is outside of a cell, it will start to break down as soon as you have water, light, UV, um, heat affecting it, or sometimes other microbes that eat DNA for breakfast. So we definitely um, have seen that you have a shorter temporal uh, sort of decay rate uh, in, in the desert versus, um, versus say, the forest. But, um, but I, once that DNA is loose, it shouldn't decay differently for a mammal versus a plant versus a microbe. So um, I think what we're seeing is even though the temporal length may vary a little bit, and it's actually um, quite predictable uh, by precipitation and other abiotic factors, uh, we, we do think that we're seeing this, this, uh, a, a scale where um, all the organisms that we're inventorying are from at least the same time window. So we're, we're, we're trying to ask questions that are appropriate to the design of, or just to what eDNA is, and, and really asking things about community, um, and not necessarily about when something was present, until we have enough data where we can actually tease that apart. And that is a goal. I think when we get you know, a couple thousand samples, we'll have a really clear picture of what's driving the, the decay of eDNA. Great, thank you. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity. Sure. And thanks. if you have any following questions, just send me an email. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you all.
Have a, have a good rest of your lunch. Bye. You as well. Bye.